call this meeting to order. Uh, all right, so first we'll uh, start with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes from the May 7th, 2019 Finance Committee meeting? So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Diazio and seconded by Mrs. Romich. Are there any comments or questions? Just that I'm not Mr. Diazio. What? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Last I checked. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Mr. Fosco. <laughs> you knew who I meant, Terry. Anyway, are there any comments or questions? No? Motion. All right. So all in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. <laughs> All right. Public comment. Is there anyone that would like to make public comment this evening? No? All right. Then we will move on then to the items uh, for work session. Budget transfers. Thank you, Mrs. Stoll. We have budget transfers tonight totaling uh, $4,038,285.61. Uh, these transfers basically reflect utilizing the proper account code and also reflects transfers that we've made from budgetary reserve. And we're asking for your approval to place this on the June 20th action meeting agenda. Okay, do I have a motion? So moved. Motion by Mr. Fusco and seconded by Mrs. Perkowski. Any comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, next item, real estate tax assessment appeals. I didn't use up my three minutes there, by the way, Mrs. Stoltz. So we're, we're way ahead. We'll yield the time back, yes. <laughs> we're ahead of the game here. Okay, real estate tax assessment appeals. You might recall um, we did recently adopt a new policy for handling district-initiated tax assessment appeals. Mm -hmm. And that policy calls for the district to identify properties that might be subject to being under-assessed and it also calls for the district, the board, to consider reviewing those properties at the June meeting. Hence, tonight, we do have a list of 42 parcels that are attached to the agenda item. And I want to give you a little bit of background of these 42 parcels, how they were identified. Uh, we actually went back and looked at sales data for the past two years and compared the sales data to the current assessed value. And where there was a discrepancy and where we felt there was a potential of a delta of $600,000 in assessed value or more, we identified those properties that are on the list tonight. So again, 42 parcels. Um, at some point in time, as we continue to develop market intelligence, it is a, there is a possibility that some of these appeals may be withdrawn. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do have an August 1st deadline with the Montgomery County Board of Assessment to file these appeals. So between uh, now and June 20th, when we're asking for your approval of these, and the time the appeals are follow, filed, if we feel some really don't meet the criteria, we can pull them off the shelf. But we felt that it would be important to at least identify the ones that we think are strong possibilities now, and then pull back ones that just don't meet the criteria based on additional information. But it's clear to us in reviewing the sales price information and comparing that to the assessed value, that there's a minimum of $600,000 disparity in assessed value for all these parcels. That's pretty substantial. <clears throat> 42 parcels is a lot. Now, keep in mind, we haven't filed any district-initiated appeals in two years. So there's a buildup, and this is based on real data now. This isn't a consultant going out and identifying properties. This is real sales data. Uh, so we feel that provides even more credible evidence because you have a recent sales transaction, which is supposed to identify the current fair market value for the property. Thank you. So what we're recommending tonight is placement on the June 20th action meeting agenda, and then we would be in compliance with the policy that the list was presented to the board and authorized by the board of the June meeting. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Fusco and seconded by Mrs. Romich. Are there any more comments or questions? Can I, for can I assume that the difference, the 600000 difference is... Um, always in our favor? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yes, yes. When we went through the properties, some were in the other direction. These are definitely in the district's favor. We're yeah. not doing both sides? No. 
No, these, are, these would only benefit the school district. Okay. So when these appeals are filed, I just want to walk through the process, what happens. The hearing has to be heard within 60 days by the Montgomery County Board of Assessment. Typically what they do in nine times out of 10 cases, they will keep the assessed value the same. They typically don't change it at that level. Uh, you do have an opportunity to negotiate a settlement though, either before the hearing or at the hearing or shortly after. If either party isn't satisfied with the Board of Assessment's decision, at that point in time, you have an opportunity to file to the Court of Common Pleas, and that's what typically happens. So that's typically when the real negotiations take place. Now, some of those cases might linger in the courts for years. In fact, uh, the Board has settled a couple of these cases recently that went back five, six, seven years. Uh, but our objective, since these are clearly in our favor, our objective will be to try to settle these as soon as possible because if we do reach a settlement, the change in assessed value would take place then July 1, 2020, next tax year. So, Mr. Skoraki, and I know this is hypothetical with 42 and it could, right, it depends uh, after it winds its way through the legal process, but, you know, what's a conservative estimate of how much tax value would be added with these 42 properties? If we are successful in, I'll call it, syncing up the sales price with the assessed value, I would say about a million dollars. Every at, year? At a minimum. Every year, yep. yes. Thank you. That's a lot. Well, it's a matter of fairness. Right. Everybody needs to pay tax according to the proper assessed valuation of their property, and these are clearly at a place where we believe that we should have a, an opportunity to have a, an appeal. Just so I'm clear, um, so if we move this to action and we vote to put these on a list, then what are the next steps? Do you issue for all of these, or are you, like, how many do we take on at one time? Like, what does the process look like? We'll continue to work with our uh, solicitor that's handling assessment appeals from Rudolph Clark. We'll continue to work with them probably up through the third week of July to determine, to make sure we do have a, a solid case, that we might be able to obtain additional information besides just the sales data. We've already looked at some of the deed information. Um, so if there's any other information that comes forward during that period of time that might indicate that, well, this appeal really isn't warranted, perhaps the property owner just really did overpay, uh, we would retract that or never file the appeal. Once we get that last week of July, that's when the paperwork will be prepared and then the solicitor will actually file the documents with Montgomery County Board of Assessment. It's really just a one-page document that needs to be filed. There is a fee associated with that, a small fee. Um, and then at that point in time, we'll go on the docket with the Board of Assessment to actually hear the appeal. Mm -hmm. And our, our argument, at least for that initial case, is going to be the disconnect between what the property owner said it was worth via that sale and what it's assessed at. With adjustments, of course, with the common level ratio, so it's not a dollar for dollar. And negotiations then comes into play because if you can reach a quick settlement, you know, perhaps it's not worth a long, drawn-out court process if you can get close to the number that you think it should be. Are there any more questions? Okay, so there is a motion on the table. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, next item is the 2019-20 homestead exemption. Uh, each year the school district receives a share of gambling proceeds, slot proceeds from the state. This coming year it's about $5.2 million between the slot proceeds and what they call the, the Sterling tax exemption. That's a Philadelphia tax credit. Uh, so $5.2 million and the board's requirement at that point in time is to redistribute that $5.2 million in the form of a homestead slash farmstead exemption. It's something we do every year and we have to distribute dollar for dollar. None of that money can be kept as a windfall by the school district. So this year there were 24,550 homestead parcels that were eligible and seven farmsteads. So if you have a farmstead and a homestead, you get both. Um, it works out then in terms of the distribution of $212.22 for every eligible parcel. So we calculate the $212.22 and then we calculate then what does that mean in assessed value? Because on the individual tax bills then the individual will see a reduction a subtraction of $212.22 and $8,132 in assessed value for Montgomery County, $1,459 in Bucks County in assessed value. So the property owner would see both reductions. 
So this is an annual approval that we're asking for. The $212.22 is up roughly a whopping 50 cents over last year. But no one will turn away that 50 cents, I'm sure. There are actually less parcels that were eligible this year compared to last year. And that's probably due to sales transaction. When a property sells, it's up to the new property owner to file another homestead exemption application. So there could be a few individuals that never filed by the deadline, but the number of parcels actually decreased by uh, roughly 100, 120 parcels. How does this appear on someone's tax bill? So it actually shows the gross amount. Let's say you have a $100,000 assessed value for your property. You would see the $100,000, and then you would see a subtraction of $8,132 in assessed value to show the net of approximately $92,000 in assessed value. So in a similar fashion, let's say your tax bill is $2,000. It would show the $2,000 gross bill, then would show the subtraction of $212 for the homestead exemption, and then show the net amount. So it shows the gross amount, the subtraction, and then the net amount as well. And then the tax collectors are required to put a little blurb in there, a couple, couple sentence blurb that the homestead exemption is courtesy of the Pennsylvania State Legislature. When they passed this bill with the gambling proceeds legalizing slot machines, this was part of it, that the slot proceeds in part went back to school districts for the homestead exemption. Thank you. All right, so do we have a motion? Second. Was that you, Jenna? Yes. Motion by Mrs. Ott, Ms. Ott and uh, seconded by Mr. Casa. Any more comments or questions for Mr. Scrocky? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, next item is the 2019-20 real estate tax installment plan. Again, this is another annual approval. We are required by law to offer installments to every property owner in North Penn School District, not just residential properties, but commercial properties as well. And historically, we've offered the installments over three equal periods. Uh, the first installment, which would be one-third of your tax bill, would be due August 1st. The second portion would be due September 16th, and the third would be due October 31st. An individual taking advantage of the installment plan would not be eligible for the 2% discount, so they would pay the flat amount of the bill. Um, it's not really a good deal because you're basically paying your money sooner than what you have to because the deadline for the flat period is October 31st anyway. So in essence, an individual taking advantage of installments is paying two-thirds of their tax bill before they really need to. Some people do it for budgeting purposes, I imagine. Um, but we only had last year, for example, 432 parcels out of the 40,000 plus that we have in the district take advantage of the installment plan. And it's been averaging somewhere around 400 parcels each year since this went into effect four years ago. Um, so we're asking for your uh, approval to place this on next Thursday's agenda as well. Uh, second, but I have a question. Um, do we have any aggregate data about who are the people who are doing that? Are they, like, probably less well-off than some others? It tends to be properties that have a lower assessed value. Yeah. Uh, but you do see a few commercial properties as well. Yeah, much to my surprise. You so, would imagine, or I would think at least, that 100% would be residential properties. And because most of our commercial properties take advantage of the 2% discount. Sure. Yeah. But we do see a few, a handful, commercial properties as well. Just looking back on the list the last couple of years, I can recall a property that was assessed at $5 million that took the installment plan. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, intuitively, it doesn't make any sense. If you have the money, hold on to it until 1031. You don't need to pay two-thirds of it prior to 1031 as you would under this installment plan. But for the residential folks, it's basically folks that are smaller Tends to be homes, lower assessed lower values, income yes. Folks. Okay, Mrs. Perkowski um, motioned and Mr. Fusco seconded. So are there any other comments or questions for Mr. Scrocky? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, next time we have is the 1920 Extended Care Program Enterprise Fund budget. Uh, I believe Margie Scott was in front of the committee at least once before, so that was to establish the 1920 rates and the program offering. So that was already taken care of. Our last piece now was to actually approve the budget. And just like the school nutrition services budget and the community education budget, the goal of 
extended care is to try to get as close to breaking even as possible. It's not meant to be uh, a money center. This budget does include a $50,000 contribution from extended care back to the general fund. That's already reflected in the general fund budget. And based on the budget that's being presented, there would be a loss for the year of $80,587. Uh, based on the current fund balance level, we feel that's definitely easy to support. Uh, we're projecting an ending fund balance at the end of the fiscal year still of over $250,000, which is a nice size fund balance for an enterprise fund. Um, so we're recommending this to be placed on the June 20th action meeting as well. Motion by Mr. McBain and seconded by Mrs. Prokowski. Um, Mr. Scrocky, that fifty thousand dollars—that's to cover, like things like the insurance and rent. Or it's or not for any rent. specific per portion. Uh, we started it two years ago, basically because we were concerned that the fund balance was growing a little large. So, I, I think one could easily argue that it's just for general overhead, not okay. any one thing in particular. And there uh, is general overhead. Right. I mean, we have yeah. folks that supervise people in this program who are part of the general fund. So uh, if we didn't have this program, those individuals would have a lighter load. Um, you know, perhaps we wouldn't need them or need them in a full-time capacity. So there are lots of incidental things also. So it's appropriate. It's been 50000 though, for several years, right? Three years now. 1920 oh. will mark the third year. Okay. Yep. Thank you. All right. Are there any other comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, on to next item F, business office operational <laughs> items. Uh, the background on this is typically in the past, at least, we have canceled uh, the July Finance Committee meeting and sometimes the August Finance Committee meeting. And this resolution is basically to allow us to continue our operations with respect to bid awards and advertising for bids that are already included in next year's budget. And procedurally, the way it would work, if we have a bid to award and we have not had the opportunity to review it with the Finance Committee, we send it out to the Finance Committee, three-day review period. If there's no objections, we move forward with the bid award if it's something that's timely in nature. And then we always go back and have the Board ratify that particular bid award at a later date. Allows us to continue with purchase orders, allows us to make budget transfers. Everything, of course, comes in front of the Board at some point. But if we miss a July meeting or August meeting, that allows us to continue with our operations and have the board ratify at a later date, the committee and then the full board. So we've had this resolution in place um, as long as I'm aware of, and we'd like to continue that resolution again just to keep operations moving uninterrupted over the summer months. Okay. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Fosco and seconded by Mrs. Romich. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, on to informational items under Section 5. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome our new student rep to our Finance Committee. And he goes by nickname JoJo, not to be confused with Joel Embiid, right? No. no. Okay. <laughs> the height's there. The height's similar. Okay, right. I noticed that, yes. <laughs> You're only 7'2", right? But uh, I appreciate you serving on the board as a student rep. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, I'm, uh, I'm currently a sophomore at North Penn, and I'm SGA's new treasurer. And I basically just, I like doing and in, being involved in various clubs through North Penn, like Link Crew, Model UN, the soccer team, and I just like a like key club. And I figured this would be another opportunity for me to get more involved in the district. We really appreciate that because you have a two-year commitment now, right? You'll be a junior next year, so yes. we have you for two years. That's great. And Billy Wormuth, your predecessor, I think you spent some time with him, and he debriefed you on some <laughs> yeah. of the, the happenings at the Finance Committee. So we certainly look forward to having you for a two-year period as well. Yes, welcome, JoJo. Well, yeah. Thank you. Welcome. You'll find finance meetings very entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> Terry loves them. <laughs> and you get camera time as well. Yeah. All of our meetings are televised. So. All right. For all six viewers. And Billy is anticipated to arrive, but a little late. He had practice for reflections tonight, I believe. So uh, I mentioned him that even if he can't make it by 7.30, to come at 7.30 for the work session, because we do have a plaque for him to recognize him for his service the past two years. <laughs> and I do want to know, too, that uh, Billy was one of three scholarship recipients from the PASBO Award of Achievement from the Tax Rebate Program. 
Uh, three $1,000 scholarships were given out as part of that PASBO Award of Achievement. Billy received one, and our student rep for the Safe Schools Committee, uh, Sharon, received a $1,000 scholarship as well. And the third student was Ryan Show. So we were appreciative of PASBO for that $3,000 scholarship, and it got divvied out to three well-deserving students. That's great. Okay, next item under information is the 1920 budget update. Uh, we will be recommending approval of the final budget next Thursday, June 20th. We did have the proposed final budget passed at the May action meeting. And we have made a couple changes. You know, we mentioned last month that we try to avoid the nickel and dime changes and try to only make changes if they're of a decent substance. So I do want to let you know that we have made some adjustments to our revenues, and we've increased revenues by $134,194. Majority of that was to increase our projected earned income tax for next year. Uh, with the way collections are actually continuing to increase this fiscal year, we felt comfortable in bumping that number up for next year. In fact, through May now, our EIT is up about 4.3%. That's pretty darn good. 4.3% is a very nice increase. And our expenditures, we decreased the expenditures by $97,255. So our current deficit right now is $6.7 million. That's with the 2.3% Act 1 increase baked into the budget. Uh, so the net changes we made was $231,000 to the good. So we're going to let things simmer here. Today's Monday. I think we kind of gave ourselves a Wednesday 4 o'clock deadline. Uh, we did just receive updated information for our IDEA grant money for next year is less than what was expected. So we'll lower revenues, but we'll also lower expenditures, too. Uh, so that'll be a one-for-one -one exchange. But we'll make that change in the final budget. If anything else comes up between now and Wednesday that's material, we'll make that change. Otherwise, we're looking at the $6.7 million deficit for next Thursday with a 2.3% tax increase. Okay. Any questions? on the budget update. Okay, moving on to item C. Um, I emailed last week, last Tuesday, I believe, the current PASBO and PASA uh, budget survey that they submit every year. I think there were almost 300 school districts out of the 500 that responded to the budget survey. And the main message, I think, from the budget survey was that School districts financially are still under stress, even though the situation might be improving somewhat, still under stress. And the stress really comes from three particular areas, charter school expense, retirement expense, and special education expense. And that's, that's true here. That's true across the Commonwealth. And uh, the data illustrates that in the last two years, charter school tuition grew by 10%. So statewide now, charter school tuition totals $1.8 billion. Uh, statewide pension costs increased by almost 11% to $3.7 billion. And special education costs grew by 4.26% to $4.6 billion. And here at North Penn, you know, Kristen presented last month, did a deep dive in our special education expenses. Our special education expenses here at North Penn are actually even going up a little bit higher than that 4.26%. So those three areas continue to be a strain on the budget, and clearly the state funding isn't even keeping up with those three areas alone, not counting anything else in the budget. Um, so that full budget survey is attached to the board document as well. Any questions on that survey? Uh, is there any indication is uh, whether they're going to include maybe school safety I mean, it seems to be such a priority I understand the legislature is looking to at least uh, put some funding into that again but I think we've observed that it's been far below what this district or any other across the state needs so I uh, just wondering how they're going to maybe account for that going forward as well we were at uh the PASBO lobby day last Tuesday at the Capitol, we had an opportunity to meet with some of our local legislators. And one of our messages was to reinstate and make it an annual allocation of $50 million in safe schools funding each year. Uh, some are arguing and advocating that the Part B money that North Penn received this year through the competitive grant process actually not be competitive anymore. I, I actually like the competitive idea, but there's some thought out there that the $50 million be allocated 
buy maybe the BEF type formula and not have it competitive. So we are trying to be advocates to reinstate $50 million in funding each year. Uh, another message we had deals with PlanCon. I'll speak to that in a minute. Uh, another message was to try to increase the special education funding, even though that's slated for a $50 million increase this coming year. It's just not enough. Uh, so those are, those are three major issues that we were driving home with our local legislators uh, in our region here, and then also statewide. PASBO is represented statewide at the lo lobby day. So we're hopeful that $50 million, and we have friends in the Capitol, uh, especially Senator Mensch in particular. He's a, a very firm advocate for school safety, and he's certainly a proponent of it. And we're hoping that with the state's surplus, the state is actually collecting more revenue than what was expected that perhaps there can be some additional funding when the state budget is passed. Thank you for that update. Thank you for uh, being at Harrisburg as well. So on the plan con, um, last Tuesday we also had the opportunity to sit on the Senate Finance Committee meeting. It was great because they were considering Senate Bill 700, which was in the Senate Finance Committee. And they moved it out of the Senate uh, Committee, Senate Finance Committee, and it's now in front of the full Senate. So Senate Bill 700 basically would implement the recommendations that were made about 13 months ago as part of the PlanCon Study Commission. And PlanCon basically is the process the state has in place whereby school districts can receive reimbursement for building projects, renovation projects, new construction projects. So there's been a moratorium and no funding for PlanCon now going on three years. So our Knapp Elementary School project, as an example, will not receive any plan con subsidy because that project is now started and there's still a moratorium. So Montgomery Elementary School project, another example, there's a moratorium when that project commenced, we will not receive any funding for that. Now moving forward, even though this has the possibility of passing the full Senate and becoming law, Senate Bill 700 doesn't have any funding attached to it. It's basically just streamlining the plan con process. The next step now is to advocate for funding, which we also did last week. Uh, we're hopeful that the funding could actually start perhaps in the 2021 fiscal year. And I emphasize to all of our local legislators that, hey, we might be looking at upwards of $300 million in borrowing for a high school project, potentially ninth grade building, potentially future renovations, potentially. Uh, plan con means a lot when you're looking at that magnitude of, of projects. Even though our reimbursement level is relatively low, it still means tens of millions of dollars when you're looking to borrow that much money for construction projects. Another part that was part of the Plan Con Advisory <clears throat> Committee not only streamlines the Plan Con process, which is a 12 step process, it would make it a, a four step process. It also makes small projects eligible for reimbursement. So, smaller capital projects that heretofore have not been eligible for any state funding would be eligible if the funding would be provided. So if you have an opportunity to speak with any uh, legislators, you know, certainly ask for their support of Senate Bill 700 now that it's made, it out, made its way out of committee and it was going to the full Senate. And I think it made its way out of committee and 47 out of the 48 senators were co-sponsors of the bill. So that's great news. There's obviously support. But the next step now is the funding. We need to ask for the funding for Senate Bill 700. So whatever you can do to help advocate that would be appreciated. Mr. Scrocky, or is Harrisburg caught up now? I know that with the recession, they had some, catch, you know, all I ever read about was that Plan Con was just trying to catch up and that was it. Right, so have they at least gotten to that point so we can move forward? They have, they have. Great. So, uh, what, and what they did to catch up, Mr. Casa, was borrow money. So <laughs> they, they borrowed money to pay the credit card bill in essence. Uh, they floated a number of bonds to actually provide the reimbursement, but all of our back projects, we are receiving reimbursement. We were held up there for a period of time, but we are receiving our reimbursement. It's called rental subsidy. Uh, we're not renting anything, so I'm not sure why they call it rental subsidy, but it's all tied into the plan con subsidy. So we are receiving it, just not for Montgomery or NAP. So while we appreciate your advocacy and work on this, and I'm certain the message is clear to everybody sitting behind this table to reach out to our legislat legislators, I think we need to make sure that we're urging the public to do so as well, because we're only a handful of people right here, and we're all citizens in this community. Not just for PlanCon, but there's also 
at the federal level uh, discussion about IDEA full funding act where there actually are, are discussions to have the federal government provide the 40 percent special education funding they're supposed to be funding um, as well as reform to charter school uh, tuition formula uh, so there's a lot out there right now that's being discussed in Harrisburg and at the federal level that uh, I encourage not just everyone behind this table but let's talk to our neighbors um, and anyone you know, watching or listening right now, uh, you have a role in this as well. So I encourage you to please call your representatives and urge them to move on some of this legislation. That's an excellent point. And one of our talking points in speaking with the legislators was that if there is no plan con funding, if there's not charter school reform, ultimately the burden, the bill is paid locally by our, our taxpayers here. So just for reference to the next step, if to to get that funding attached, it would go before that would have to come out of the Appropriations Committee. Eventually it would. Yes. And we're thinking that unfortunately the ship has sailed for the 1920 fiscal year mm -hmm. that we're starting that conversation for 2021. But the first key point was to accept the recommendations from that plan con study commission. So that's a great first step. So now the next step, the next conversation, assuming this passes, and I really see no reason why it wouldn't. The next step now is to plant the seed for next year that we need now to have funding for the reform, for the plan kind of reform. Well, and it's great news, especially since there are so many co-sponsors. So hopefully that's a sign. But um, I'm looking at the members of the Appropriations Committee, and it doesn't appear that we have any local, or at least within the North Penn School District, tied to that either. So I think general public awareness and advocacy is, is, is the key. Just a second, what Mr. Fusco said. Okay, that would take us now to the uh, reports, the monthly financial reports. I did provide a summary on all the reports, just a couple quick highlights. Um, these reports are through the month of April, uh, and we actually have the data now for May, uh, but the reports aren't completed yet for May. But the trend continues to be the same. We are bringing in more revenue than what was budgeted. We're projecting a $2.5 million variance on the revenue side, and that's great news. On the expenditure side, we're expecting to underspend our budget by about $1.1 million. That's great news. Um, and that $1.1 million, keep in mind that whatever we underspend the expenditure budget by, that's what can be considered for a capital reserve fund transfer at some point. So once that number is in the process of being finalized, probably sometime in August when we're working with our auditors doing final entries, maybe September, that's when we'll make a recommendation for the exact amount. So it looks like we'll be in a position to at least recommend a, a, a transfer to the capital reserve fund of at least a million dollars. And that's really good. We need that to be uh, funded as well for the projects we have in the pipeline. I mentioned earlier, earned income tax continues to be strong. Uh, the report that's posted is through April, but if you take it out through May, we're at about a 4.3% increase in EIT over the past year. Uh, realty transfer tax, sales of properties, Unfortunately, those have tapered off in the past couple months. We got out of the gates like gangbusters at the beginning of the fiscal year. That has tapered off somewhat. So uh, we'll probably barely meet budget with a realty transfer tax. Investment income continues to be very strong. Uh, we've certainly increased that number dramatically. My concern there now is there's chatter and increasing probability that the Fed might cut rates, which will definitely have an impact on our investment income that the probability is somewhere around 80% that the Fed cuts this year, this calendar year. So that will actually be an impairment to the 1920 fiscal year. Uh, we won't be able to come in over budget like we have in the past. So if there's multiple rate cuts next fiscal year, that'll really be concerning that we might not be able to meet the budget, but you know, we'll deal with that as it, as it comes. But other than that, this fiscal year is shaping up to be pretty good. Uh, not necessarily as great as previous years because our margins are getting smaller, our variances are getting smaller, but we're still within that 1% variance that we shoot for both on the revenue and the expenditure side. Great. And I think that concludes our Finance Committee information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Scrocky. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Scrocky regarding these reports? Can I go back to something? Absolutely. Actually, it's not about the financial reports. Something's the the penalty essentially that is paid by people who are making those payments, uh, the school tax payments and installments. Mm -hmm. I want to be 
see if I can understand sure. this correctly. They're paying, they're actually starting to pay earlier than the folks who are not actually getting a penalty, correct? Correct. And it's probably safe to assume that the re residential folks that are doing that are simply doing that because they have to, because they just don't have the money up front to pay at the October bill. So, I mean, is it something we could look at to, I mean, how much revenue do we generate from that 2% penalty on these folks? Yeah, it seems inherently unfair that we're charging more to the folks who can afford it the least. So they're not being charged a 2% penalty. So if you're, the flat amount of your bill is $1,000. Right. They would pay the, the $333, 333 and then another 333 Okay. Over a three-month, basically over a four-month period. Okay. So I think the individuals that take advantage of it is basically we're managing the cash flow for them. Okay. Because another way it would be that, okay, if I have $333, to pay by the end of July. Why don't I just keep that in the bank? Right, and, and then and my next three thirty three yeah. keep in the bank, and then when I'm making that final payment, make my six hundred sixty six dollar withdrawal from the bank, add but, my my third installment, if you will, and just pay it all by ten thirty one. But did the, I miss something? Because I thought there was a two percent. You can't take the two percent discount. Discount. Well, yes. okay. So in fairness, though, it's kind of semantics, right? Because if most people are getting the discount, it's almost really a penalty for the people that aren't. Well, the key difference, though, is. If you take the 2% discount, that has to be paid by the end of August. Right. These individuals will make their final payment okay. by the end of October. Okay. So they're paying the flat amount of the bill. No discount, no penalty, just the flat amount of the bill. Right. Now, most people pay in full with the 2% discount by the end of August. That's why our cash flow is at it's its so highest point at in, in August. Uh, and a lesser percentage get the 10% penalty that's levied starting November 1st. So I, I really believe that this is a matter of cash flow management more yeah. than anything else. Okay. I have a comment. Uh, just Mr. Scrocky and uh, Ms. Johnson, the rest of the business office, thank you very much for your very hard work all year and preparing us, uh, you know, in that continuous cycle for the next year. Uh, you know, I recall some of the, my very first meetings here as a board member. You talked about that variance and how important it was also with Moody's, right? So, um, and though you've always been uh, extra cautious in those projections, we appreciate that. The numbers can sometimes seem very big when the public just hears that in a headline. But I'm very appreciative that you give us the worst case scenario and, you know, it's typically, you know, because of your sound management, the effectiveness and efficiency of the the rest of the team and administration that we're able to see this type of uh, swing, even though it's 1%, you know, this was a projected deficit this year and we still came out $900,000, you know, up. And that, you know, that isn't what is always reported or what the public uh, understands. And I think it's very important for us to reinforce uh, the strength of North Penn in managing taxpayer dollars. Thank you very much. Thank you. And moving on then, if there are no further comments, um, this is a second opportunity for public comment. Would anyone like to make public comment? Ms. Rupp? Anybody? Dan? No? Okay. All right, then um, the summary of items being moved to action meeting will be the budget transfers, the 2019 real estate tax assessment appeals, the 2019 to 20 homestead exemption, the 2019 20 real estate tax installment plan, and the 2019 20 extended care program enterprise fund. Right? And the business op office operational items. Yes. Okay. And the next finance committee dates are possibly July 9th and uh, August 6th, but they are subject to possibly being canceled. So, which we'll post publicly if they are. Okay. So, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Mo motion by Mrs. Perkowski, seconded by Mrs. Mr. Fusco. Meeting adjourned. Thanks. Thank you.